Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, uh, Navigating South Florida Insurance. Um, it's it's going to be a very interesting topic. There's been so much going on over the past couple of months. I'm sure many of you have experienced, um, especially from the condo side, uh, recent increases. Um, our legislator recently passed a bill in December um, that's making some changes, and that's the purpose of today's webinar. So we're looking uh, forward to answering your questions. If you have any questions that you'd like answered that are dealing uh, directly with insurance, uh, please use the Q&A function at the bottom or top of your screen. Uh, both myself, Michael, and Andrew will do our best to get to those questions. Uh, we will give you some early disclosure. This is a lot to unpack, so we may not be able to go through everything. Um, each and every one of us are doing our best to understand how uh, this is going to impact our associations, our homeowners. Um, so bear with us as we give you this information. If we don't have answers that we can provide you today, we'll do our best to get back to you. Uh, so with further ado, I wanted to open up the webinar and give Andrew and Michael an opportunity to introduce themselves. So I'll start here with my left, uh, with Michael Bender, if you want to say something about yourself and the firm you represent. Thank you, Rafael, and uh, thank you, Affinity, for, for hosting this. Uh, Andrew, glad to be here with you. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Mike Bender, and for those who are, do not know, law firm is K. Bender Rembaum. We are a community association law firm. Our focus rep is in representing your condominiums, cooperatives, HOAs. Uh, we are 21 attorneys with four offices. 11 of us are board certified specialists in uh, 10 in condominium plan unit development. We also have board certified construction law lawyer. Uh, we are very active in legislation. We are very active in education. Um, and if any of you are looking for, uh, if you're looking for new counsel or additional counsel, uh, or if you're a current client of the firm uh, and you need some help, uh, you can reach out, uh, info at kbrlegal.com, and uh, you'll probably get our information passed on after. But I look forward to sharing with you for the next 45 to 50 minutes uh, and hopefully giving some information that you guys can use. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you so much, Michael, for being here. It's always a pleasure to be on webinar uh, with you and all the knowledge that you provide. So thank you so much for being here today. Uh, Andrew, you want to say something about yourself? Yeah, yeah, I... Uh... I appreciate you putting this together, Raphael. We're, we're looking forward to this conversation. Um, again, my name's Andrew Massey and I'm with Plastridge Insurance. We're a family owned insurance agency headquartered in Delray Beach. We have offices in Palm Beach Garden, Stewart and Boca Raton as well. And this is an incredibly, incredibly difficult insurance market. I'm sure most of you are very familiar with that at this point, but uh, this, this legislation is very meaningful. It's it's probably the most significant change to Florida's insurance le legislation in quite some time. So we're looking forward to to discussing it and probably tackling some some tough to answer questions. Great, thank you so much for being on, Andrew. Uh, appreciate uh, you taking the time out of your day to uh, to come on this webinar and provide your information from the insurance side of things. As for myself, my name is Rafael Aquino. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Affinity Management Services. Um, uh, hopefully many of you have attended our previous webinars and this current webinar, but ultimately we are a community association management company. Uh, we're more of a boutique operation that focuses in Bay, Broward, Palm Beach County, and now we're proud to say we're moving into the Naples market. Uh, we're more of that uh, medium-sized organization that really focuses on building strong partnerships with our clients uh, that revolve around the data that we provide, the people that we have, as well as the relationships that we build with our clients. So any questions when it comes to your community association, don't hesitate to reach out to us. I know both of you have thanked me for putting this together, but ultimately it was my team behind the scenes. So I do wanna thank them uh, for putting this webinar together. So uh, with further ado, I wanted to get started. I'm sure many of the board members that we have close to 60% uh, of our participants today are board members and 72% of them uh, live within condo associations. Uh, so why don't we start with you, Michael, if you can give us a little bit of an explanation on what SB2A means and and uh, and give us kind of like a 30,000 foot perspective of what the <laughs> legislation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'll give you the I'll give you the bullet point, the, the cliff cliff notes, if cliff we all notes, remember those go. from uh, our back in the day before there were computers. <laughs> uh, the, the, all right. Well, so the, the Florida legislature did convene December 11th uh, through the 13th. And the whole, the sole purpose of this special session was to consider legislation uh, with regard uh, 
to create a legislation to do among the following uh, reduce primarily reduce the cost of litigation regarding property insurance claims and you'll hear about how they did that foster the availability of reinsurance for property insurance and Andrew's going to tell you what all that means uh, improve claims handling practices in property insurance they also did modify deadlines uh, for notices of property insurance losses and limit the assignment of benefits under property insurance policies and, and we'll get into that as well uh, prescribe property insurance requirements regarding alternative dispute resolutions uh, processes, and we'll talk briefly about arbitration and, and the options there. Um, and then, of course, insurance oversight. They want to have insurance oversight of the property insurance market participants and improve the financial stability of citizens' property insurance. Uh, that was a big place, uh, a play as well. Um, so Senate Bill 2A is a, it's a comprehensive bill. It was over, it's 1405 pages. Uh, and it's it, the intention is to ensure policyholders in the state have access to quality, affordable private market property insurance. Uh, I mean, that that is the whole objective. Um, as we'll get into the specifics, uh, Rafael, you, you'll see that that is uh, that is the end goal. Um, but I want to give I, I want to start off two things. One, and I should say this, guys, I'm not providing legal advice. I'm here. It's informational purposes only, so I need to say that. Secondly, don't shoot. Our, we're the messengers, and so don't shoot the messengers, guys. Because uh, I don't think, you know, we're not looking at, at immediate relief for uh, our, us as homeowners or condominium associate, or condominium associations or HOAs or us as personal line owners. Uh, we're not going to see immediate relief. But as, as we get into it, and Andrew's going to give us some more specifics as well, you'll see the objective of this, this bill um, and, and how it hopefully will eventually uh, in 18 to 24 months start showing some real, real <clears throat> progress for those of us whose bills have been going up drastically. I can tell you guys, mine went up 95% over the last three years. So this is, you know, we feel it personally as well as professionally. Great. Thank you for that, Michael. Yeah, I know the impact has been huge. I mean, many of our condo associations and homeowner association have seen significant increases. I know our legislators did, you know, are doing their best to try to find, find or tweak some reform so that these premiums can go down. Um, however, I, I wanted to ask you, you know, especially that you're in this on a day-to-day, -day, Andrew, um, you're dealing with these uh, insurance companies. Uh, uh, what do you believe? Do you believe this legislation will have any meaningful impact to insurance premiums? And as Michael kind of mentioned, do you, do you believe it's going to be something that's a quick relief or something that may take uh, some time? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the question, right? They <laughs> they finally met. They finally had the conversations. Now the question is, uh, is what happens? <laughs> um but I, I do, I, I definitely agree with Michael. I think this is certainly a long-term fix, but, but it's, it's also intended not to be a Band-Aid, right? It's, it's a long-term fix because I think what they're trying to do is actually address some of these underlying issues that have kind of created a very attractive environment in Florida for insurance fraud and insurance fraudulent litigation. That's that's the key. So Michael and I and we're, we're kind of chatting before we went live. And one of the first things I said to him was, this is great. It's just a shame that they're two years late. <laughs> you know, we we wish that they started this earlier because it is going to take some time. That being said, I, I do think it's a critical first step. I, I think some of the things in this bill are, uh, at least the intent is good. I think um, ideally it is going to remove some of these underlying issues that are making it very, very difficult for insurance carriers to operate here, right? And, and operate profitably. And ultimately what that is going to lead to ideally is carriers coming back into the market. Right. That's that's the whole goal is that not only are the insurance premiums going up drastically, but what's happening is carriers are also leaving. So the the position that board members and managers are finding themselves in is trying to, to navigate and trying to buy a product in a market where the premiums are going up significantly, but the supply of carriers is actually going down. So that's that's a very, very difficult market to navigate. And what we're hopeful is going to happen is that in this bill, if if the overall legal environment becomes more attractive, 
carriers are going to want to come back and they're going to see an opportunity to come back into the market and we'll see competition, which is is really the the, the problem right now in the market. Yeah, it falls back to the whole, you know, supply and demand concept. Uh, um, but as we were talking a little bit earlier, and as Michael kind of stated earlier, it, it, it is something that's going to take time because, you know, until they start seeing these benefits, uh, hopefully, we're all hopeful that they do come, um, insurance companies will, will not bring any reduction into the prices because obviously they're going to want to see those benefits first. Then the question becomes, uh, will they actually pass those benefits on? And hopefully uh, time will tell. So there's uh, nothing currently in the law that addresses that. Not that not that there is a way to actually address it, but at some future point, I mean, if, if they are starting, there should be more competition coming in and then that should drive rates down, should. Um, and, and that's our, and as we get more into the specifics and, and Andrew has some pretty um, staggering numbers about when we get into the litigation and, and really where this is coming from, but you're right, Raphael, if we start seeing, if these carriers start seeing these savings, and even the carriers that are there now, uh, there's nothing in this bill that mandates they pass those savings on to us, the consumers. So, but uh, hopefully that will that'll, that will fall in line uh, and the, the, there'll be a, enough oversight, which is part of the bill. There's supposed to be enough oversight over these and carriers that we will see that. But again, 2025 is the soonest I'm expecting it, guys. Yeah. Realistically. Yeah. And the reality is, I mean, it's been very cyclical. Um, I, I mean, I recall about eight, nine years ago um, that rates were extremely high. And then, you know, again, we didn't have providers. Everyone was going to citizens. Then new markets opened up. The difference, you know, in my opinion now, it's just obviously there's been much more impact when it comes to storms, the amount of storms, the frequency. And, and we don't know if we're going to go through a cyclical change as we do, like similar to the real estate market, where every 8 to 10, 12 years, we're going through these ups and downs. Um, things are just going to get a little bit more challenging, unfortunately, for, for Florida. And with the claims, you know, the angle that we're hearing pretty much through the media is a lot of the lawsuits, especially Florida. I think I had read that out of all the claims, we were close to 79 percent of them throughout the entire country, which you know, that is eye-opening. We'd have to dig into the data. Um, but I did I did kind of want to ask you, Michael, and, you know, in 2021, there were more than, they say, about 116,000 lawsuits filed in Florida um, against property insurers. Do you believe that this bill reduce or eliminate um, frivolous uh, litigations or lawsuits? Uh, first, I'll say alleged frivolous. <laughs> Because <laughs> um, then again, yes, there's no question. There, there, there's no, there's. I'm. I don't doubt. I shouldn't say there's no question. I don't doubt that there are instances of claims being filed which may not necessarily all be valid. Unfortunately, um, and we talked about this just before we jumped on. Is you know the concern at least I have um, from my 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 viewpoint, which is you know the association side and the homeowner side, uh, is will. Uh, Will it, it will the valid claims get sort of caught up in in the uh, attempt at eliminating the fraudulent claims and therefore make valid claims that much more hard, difficult for those of us with those valid claims to process? Or will the carriers truly step up and say these are valid? We will address them the way we need to and not rubber stamp, you know, denied and then have us have to fight. Um, as we'll talk about, because there's, uh, th we'll talk about briefly the, the bad faith part of that, which is also more challenging for the the, uh, the, the consumer side. Um, so the the two items that we'll talk about, and, uh, and Andrew will will jump in on this as well, uh, is that they, that they are two primary areas of the bill to address the alleged fraudulent claims and try to minimize or limit uh, eliminate them. One is the awards of attorney's fees in litigation. Uh, there, there has it's been a very Florida has been a very claimant friendly state prior to this bill where they allowed one way attorney fee provisions. And just so we're clear, what that meant was that that if you brought a, a, a case against the carrier and you prevailed you in court, you were entitled to prevailing party fees. If you didn't, the carrier was not. And that's simplifying it, but essentially that's a one-way fees. They've eliminated that. Um, so if it's a lawsuit arising under a residential or commercial property insurance claim, there's no more one-way provision. So you, as the, the, the <clears throat> consumer, if you're bringing a case against the carrier and you lose you could be responsible for paying their fees. So that, and, and, and so 
that there is a risk, uh, a, le- a higher level of risk for someone bringing this claim, you know, uh, and 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 so the 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 the, the thought process I can uh, I surmise and 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 the, the legislative intent behind these bills will support this I sur- believe uh, is hey if if you have the risk of losing in court and having to pay carriers fees you're less likely to bring a case unless you believe in your heart of hearts and you know it's rock solid or you believe it's rock solid. And then that ties into my concern is I may have a valid claim. Maybe I don't prove it up in court. Maybe I have bad counsel, who knows, um, But uh, or just not enough information to support it, but it's a good claim and, and it gets lost in, and, and I'm, I'm not willing to take that risk. Um, but we'll see. But that's one of the big things is they want to eliminate. They eliminated the one-way attorney fee provision, so they're hopeful that that will will, will uh, decrease the suits. And then the second, uh, and then Andrew, I'm going to ask you to expound on both of these on your, from your perspective. Um, the assignment of benefits, and um, so it prohibits the assignment in whole or in part of any post-loss insurance benefit under any residential property insurance policy or any commercial policy issued after January one of this year. Uh, this, by the way, someone asked earlier, uh, someone had asked me, when does the bill take effect? The bill took effect when the governor signed it December 16th. This is the law of the, the Florida right now. And so they've eliminated assignment of benefits. And, and Andrew, you're going to get, I think you were going to get more into exact talking about what that is. So um, I'll ask you from your perspective, uh, the elimination of the one-way attorney fee provision, did you have anything more you want to add on that? And then please talk to us about assignment of benefits because you gave such a good example earlier before we jumped on. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the the uh, the one way attorneys fees. I, in my opinion, I I think that that was the single most meaningful thing that they could have done long term. And and the reason I say that, and Michael, you you and I spoke before, and we kind of we we kind of had a conversation that led up to this right before we jumped on. But I think when we're having this conversation. The, the importance of differentiating between a, a legitimate claim where maybe the carrier's not doing the right thing or the carrier's acting in bad faith, if that's the case, we always encourage our clients to hire a public adjuster or hire an attorney to sue the insurance company if they're not doing the right thing. But it, it is very critical to differentiate between that and a fraudulent claim from the start. Right. So so when these when when this bill eliminates things like the one way attorney's fees, the intent of that is to make it much more difficult for unscrupulous attorneys, right, and unscrupulous adjusters to to basically sign up mass numbers of people to sue their insurance companies because it it eliminates the incentive of pursuing a, a fraudulent or a weak claim, right? I, I think one of the one of the things that you mentioned, Michael, which is important, is we never want to put the policyholder in a position where they they're they're having to bring a claim and and fight that claim, you know, in a in a dis in, in a disadvantageous way, right? But but what we need to be what this is trying to address is eliminating kind of the free for all that's out there right now because and and this is very related the the one way attorney's fees and the assignment of benefits are are almost intertwined because right. what's happening is and again it, i think it's something like four or five law firms are driving 85% or more of of this litigation but what's happening is these two things combine the assignment of benefits, which just so we're clear as to what that does, it's it's a letter where once once a policyholder signs that letter, they transfer the rights and they transfer the control of their insurance policy over to whoever they signed it for. Right. So so what happens, these two things combined has kind of created this pit for roofers and adjusters where they can essentially go door to door and right. and they basically say sign this letter right let us take over your insurance policy and then let's sue your insurance company and by the way just so you know when we do that there's one way attorney's fees so even if we lose it doesn't matter you're not on the hook for anything right so 
I'm not saying that's that's right or that's the way it actually plays out. I'm saying that's the pitch. Right. And the reason I'm saying that is because I get these calls frequently. Yeah. I get calls, you know, still to this day where an, an association will call me and say, Andrew, I, I just wanted to run something by you. We, we had a roofer get up on our roof and tell us that if we go back and if we put in a Hurricane Irma claim, right, not Hurricane Ian, which was last year, Hurricane Irma, which was 2017, and we sue our insurance company, they can get us free roofs, <laughs> right? So, so that's, that's what the industry is kind of fighting against. And again, I, of course, I'm in the industry, but carriers don't always do the right thing. I'm the first to say. But, but the challenge is that the environment as it was with these one-way attorney's fees and with the, the assignment of benefits abuse, man, it, it really was almost a, a perfect environment for, for this type of fraud. So, you know, I, I, hope I'm, I hope I'm doing a good job of differentiating between the fraud and the legitimate need for public adjusters and attorneys. Right. But it's also a fine line. It's yeah. difficult yeah. to find. No, I thought I, I thought your your explanation was good. I will say that um yeah, there's no question. The assignment of benefit, eliminating the assignment of benefits and eliminating the one way attorneys fees are are are, are t they are part and parcel. And yeah. the way you put it together does make perfect sense for that example you gave. Yeah. My, and and my and I, I throw this out as a question, which really it should be better directed to the to legislators. Is so is it, rather than eliminating that assignment of benefits. Why not make the person who got the assignment be responsible for prevailing party fees if they were bringing the claim and lose? You know, yeah. you know. I mean, now, now you because now if I'm that roofer, if I want to bring that claim and it turns out that there's there's it's a fraudulent claim, I'm now the one on the hook for paying the carrier's fees, not not the policy the policyholder assigned benefits. So maybe you know maybe that would have been a way to uh, because that would allowed still the valid claims. To, to move forward with uh, where, where the owners really don't know what they're doing and there's uh, professionals who who are legitimate and trust and, and I want to yeah. point out, there are many many very much above board roofers and adjusters and lawyers who handle these claims because the carriers are not necessarily always approving claims that are valid and and, and unfortunately and so I think you know and Andrew and I and, and that to Andrew's point and I respect that he uh in his in, being this position he plays in the industry. So I respect that he's saying is right. Um, and so I think that's the fine line. So, but this is where we're at, you know, this is what we've got. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Look, I think, you know, in, in my opinion, I, I just, I, I, I understood the direction that they're going in. And I, and I get the whole, um, you know, not being able to assign the benefits from your perspective. The, the challenge that I see is that ultimately what's happening is that now they're now the, bur the burden is going to fall completely on the consumer which doesn't understand the day-to-day -day operations of insurance and the policies and all the complexities that go into that. I know speaking from a property management perspective, you know, we're just like a liaison, we're, we're just basically put people together and we put the right people together. Like Michael said, there's a ton of great roofers, a ton of great public adjusters, a ton of great attorneys, and we rely heavily on those professionals. Now what, with, with the assignments not being able to be assigned, let's say to a true professional, it's putting that burden now on the policyholder to really handle it on their own or be, be able to do what they paid their insurance for, which is for them to provide a claim, provide reasonable time frames to get these responses. And many times, the reason why, at least I can say from an association side, why we hire a public adjuster, which unfortunately in the world, the, the, the given people have given them a bad reputation, is because we don't see traction from the carrier yeah. to move these claims forward. Right. Not all the time, because I can't generalize them um, either, but I would say a higher majority of the time it's not. So that's why we rely on, on these professionals um, to do this kind of work. So, and what I didn't like what the bill threw out is that yes, they shortened the time frame for responses from insurance companies, right. but when they need them the most, which is during hurricanes, they said, no, the time frame's no longer, they're out the window. So, um, you know, I found that to be a bit amusing because that's when we need them the most. Uh, but, and I get it, it's not a knock obviously against you. I've just, I, I get what our legislators were doing. Um, and, and unfortunately, you know, if we have these bad apples, those are the ones that change everything for the, the individuals that are yeah. doing the right thing. But what we should have done, and, and, I, and I get it that our legislators have so many things to focus on, 
but we're, we're in a society and we're in a world of data and data drives many of the decisions that business owners uh, make. I know I can speak for, for my own firm. So if you know that these are the four law firms, if you know that, hey, which are the roofers that they, they should have that data? Okay, here, these were all AOB, sorry, assignment of benefits. These are the, the firms that are tied to it. Let's tie, let, let, they should be doing that homework to give to our, look, this is the impacts. This is what from the firms it's coming from and build legislation specifically towards that, not generalizing it uh, for everyone because then it makes it much more difficult. Now you're going to have consumers that may not file claims because they're like, well, I can't pay attorney fees. We don't have the money to do it. Um, so you know what, let it be. And then later the damages that do happen down the road, many times, two to three, four years, they're the ones having to, um, to deal with that. So that's kind of my take, uh, not against you, Andrew, in any way, but no, I, 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 it's just, I understand the frustration. He doesn't the, take it personally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> how, Listen. Uh, how we're going to have to deal with it from a management side and, and educating our board members of, of these steps. And I can see many challenging, many challenging challenges coming from it. And I understand that many times you have to take the simple route on umbrella things. But in this case, you know, I think that the data was there and more work should have been done. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, when there's a situation that we have costs going up for, for um, reserves, for, insur for insurance, for inflation, hey, this is a great time um, for us to take advantage and push this uh, bill that we've been trying to get done. Um, that's my take on it. But, um, you know, again, as you opened up earlier, something of this nature should have been addressed uh, years ago. Yeah. And for many of my well, associations, a bit long winded, but I do want to bring this up for many associations that are on this call, board members and managers alike. This is an example of why um, you cannot delay the work that needs to be done in your associations, because you have to look at yourself as well in the mirror and realize that as an association, if you haven't fixed your roof in 30 years, if you haven't done work to your association, in all honesty, now to defend the insurance companies, it's not their fault that all oh, of hurricane came, we didn't do anything, now we need a complete replacement. You should have done the work that you needed to do to maintain it properly. So th there's so, so much that goes into this. Um, I know we've seen it already, um, citizens already st starting to send letters, you know, with ample time, 120 days, we're not gonna insure you anymore. Uh, because work hasn't been done to, to your property. So, so it's coming from all angles. Um, but ultimately, you know, it, something needs to be done. Uh, I just feel that the way things were handled in this particular instance, it could have been handled a little bit uh, differently. So, but just to bring it, it back feels to it power, feels a little heavy handed. It does feel yeah. a little handed, you know, uh, in but, you know, well, I won't say but it feels a little handed. And though the objective is to drive carriers back into the marketplace. Yeah, correct. You know, I, when I read, the, you know, when I read this over oh, this bill and I said the bill like my and I mentioned to you guys before, my take on this was, wow, when this bill got signed by the governor, I think the the, the carriers in the state were very happy. Uh, and those and those carriers who were considering, hey, you know, we could get back into the Florida market, were very happy. Um, us the consumer side, not so much. Um, because everyone was hoping that there'd be some kind of panacea, some kind of immediate relief, you know, cap, you know, capping of rates, automatic reduction rates. I mean, all the things that, and I don't know, that were just unfortunately not realistic. Um, and so the objective here is to drive competition back into the marketplace with the intent, the hope and intent that the more competition there is, the better, better rate options will be presented. Um, and the, and, but that is not something we're going to see for a while. And the other thing you talked about, you know, with the reduction of timeframes, um, you know, and there is, you know, they did reduce timeframes to, you know, review claims, deny claims, inspect, investigate all those things. And, and, and my question, um, is if they're not meeting those guidelines, those deadlines, uh, what's the penalty to them? Is that where they're in bad faith? <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? Because they also in this bill, did address bad faith to settle actions against property insurers. And now what it, what I understand the bill to say is uh, bad faith litigation for failure to settle a claim can, may not be filed until after the insured has established through an adverse adjudication by a court that the insurance company breached the contract and a final judgment or decree has been rendered against the carrier. So and and you we all know and everybody listening knows lawsuits don't conclude overnight. 
So what we're saying here is if they're not meeting these required deadlines, to me, if they if this law says you have these deadlines to meet and you can't provide documentation as to why you're not meeting them other than you're just not getting to them, well, that seems to me that is a version of bad faith or should be a version of bad faith, again, where these carriers have to, because at least then there's some teeth in the bill that we can say to our clients um, collectively, hey, there's a little bit of teeth, that if they're not meeting this, that would be considered something that you could pursue them in bad as bad, at least notify them that this is bad faith and get them to start pursuing. If they still don't, you can proceed with a bad faith claim. But you can't even offer that now because you have to actually sue them and win in court before you can then go after them for bad faith, at least as I read that. And I think that's that's troubling to me. Yeah, yeah. Andrew, and what's your take in general? Do you believe uh, you, we will see some more competitive uh, rates um, or people coming into the market? Because as I said earlier, I mean, we we went through this. Was it about eight or 10 years ago? It was I know we went through yeah. this some time ago and then, you know, it became competitive again and rates significantly dropped. Um, yeah. how, how long? And um, obviously we can't hold you to the time frame, but based on your experience and your knowledge, uh, do you think that it'll get more competitive with time? Yeah, so insurance is very cyclical. I mean, yeah. it, it is. It's that's the nature of the market. You know, if if we look back, it honestly it wasn't that long ago, four or five years ago, we were sitting down and we're doing, you know, 10% year over year decrease meetings. And we're talking, <laughs> you know, about options from three or four different carriers. It's, you know, obviously a much different market. What I will say is that this market is is very likely the most difficult market on record ever in Florida. And our, our agency was founded in 1919. We have active agents that have been doing this for 60 plus years, and it's not even close. I mean, it's, it's way worse than after Andrew, than after Wilma. And it's, you know, so, so that's why something had to be done. And I, I know that, you know, it, it, we're not legislators and, and these conversations are very important. It's, you know, I'm not taking anything personally. I know that I'm in the industry, but if we don't have these conversations, then how, you know, we, we can't make a positive change. Right. right. So, so it's, these, these are discussions that have to be had and, and something that, that you kind of alluded to earlier, Raphael, and this kind of ties back into do we think we're going to see a positive change was with regards to public adjusters and, and public adjusters getting a bad rap, right? And, and the reason they get that rap is you're right. A handful of them ruin it for everyone. <laughs> there is, there's without a doubt a time when it makes sense to get a public adjuster and fight the insurance company. When, when we have those scenarios as the agent for our clients, we're part of that fight. I mean, it's, you know, there's a time where the gloves come off and, and we fight for the claim, but the, the difference between those public adjusters and the ones I'm talking about that are the problem is that the ones that I'm talking about suggested the claim, yeah. right? They, yeah. they suggested that the claim gets filed. They didn't come in when the claim wasn't being handled right. It was their idea you know, whether, whether there was damage or not. So that's, those are the public adjusters that they're trying to target in this bill. And again, I, I agree it's, it's not perfect, but I don't know, like I said, something had to be done. This, this is a time sensitive thing. We're doing 50% plus yeah. year over year increases for, for our association. So something has to change. And, and I don't know, it gets very difficult. Again, we're not legislators, but what do you do? Do you, do you take the assignment of benefits away from only certain firms or do you, you know, that's, that's very, that's very difficult. I, I'd be interested. I don't know how much thought you've put into that, Michael, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but None. I, yeah, that would be that, that would be almost impossible. I think from a business yeah. perspective, that'd be targeted, right? I, I definitely yeah, well, well, right. Well, the other thing is too, like you know, you mentioned, you know, Andrew, your, your stats. I think four or five firms, eighty percent of the market, but yeah. that doesn't mean that those four or five firms are doing anything improper. Right. 
Correct. Um, Correct. You know, again, Only uh, I, I'm just saying, because yeah. you know, I mean, I'm aware of some of these firms and I know mm. they do excellent work and, and get great results for clients who have otherwise valid claims that are not being properly handled by right. their, their carriers. Yeah. And I'm not suggesting that's all the carriers either. But so, you know, that that's the reason why I think it's, it's, Raphael, it's hard to, to <laughs> choose. You got to really, so the, the, no, the yeah, objective no, I, I get, meant, oh, yeah. But no, I agree with you, Jen, Andrew. Is, I wish they would have addressed this a couple of years ago. Uh, they they should have they could have even addressed this you know during the session last year um, you know the, their focus unfortunately was was elsewhere uh, and I, yeah. I'd like to get back to focusing on issues that more impact us in the state as opposed to maybe the culture wars. Correct. Yeah, and and, <laughs> and, and with regards to that, the point is more of analyzing the data to understand yeah. the direction that you take because once you know this is where the significant this is where the pain points are, you can study them and see what better direction you can take. So Michael, this stuff has gotten out of control for our associations. I know you yeah. deal with it. I know you get phone calls on it. We get phone calls on it. What's your take? Because I know we recently had an email from one of the uh, from one of the participants that were coming on to the webinar. Their question was, because it, it, the biggest impact we're seeing is on the wind coverage. And if some associations are potentially that one sent an email saying, uh, the statute require us to have right. wind coverage for our uh, condo association and what potential uh, liabilities do they have if the board decides not to take that wind coverage? Right, well, well, let's talk, you mentioned over 70% of the, the listeners are the condo world. So I'll, you know, the for those of you who are in the HOA world, um, the insurance obligations are gonna be set forth in your governing documents. Mm -hmm. uh, chapter 720 of the Florida Statutes does not address insurance. So you need to review your governing documents with your legal counsel and your business advisors, your management team, and make sure that you are uh, addressing adequate insurance, uh, your insurance needs. So chapter 718 provides adequate property insurance, regardless of any requirement in your docu governing documents, is to be obtained by the association for its as full insurable value, uh, replacement co cost or similar co coverage. Um, and it's based on the replacement cost of the property to be insured as determined by an independent insurance appraisal or update of a prior appraisal. And I saw there was a question here um, from an anonymous attendee. How often should you get it? So if you're in a condominium, it's, statu it's statutorily provided that the replacement cost must be determined at least once every 36 months. So there's your answer. So adequate property insurance is, is what it says. Now, it, does it say windstorm? It does not. If you live in Florida and in, in South Florida, well, if you live anywhere in Florida, is windstorm coverage going to be part of what would be considered adequate property insurance? My opinion, no question. No question at all. So, um, I, you know, the, the, the advice that I give, again, not legal advice, <laughs> but my, my guidance here is, you know, you, you if you're if you're if you're a board member volunteering in a condominium, you need to ensure adequate that your condominium is adequately that has adequate property insurance that addresses the replacement cost of the property. That will include when proper windstorm coverage. Uh, and and the, the the second part, Rafael, you said, and what the what is the uh, uh, potential consequences? For failing to have that, uh, and and is in the seven seven eighteen world, and even in the HOA, if your governing documents provide, your failure to do that is a breach of your fiduciary duty. You know, I mean, if the statute says you have to have adequate property insurance, and you fail to and you fail to have adequate property insurance, and as a result of that failure, there is damage that is now not recoverable from a carrier. You have to go out of the all owners have to go out of pocket to address that damage. That's as a direct result of the board's breach of their fiduciary duty in meeting their one of their obligations yeah. under the statute, insure, uh, obtaining adequate property insurance. Um, and I will point this out, I will mention this because board members, you should be aware of this, um, whether that liability will be go beyond like a DNO coverage claim, if that's even available for this, and I don't know that, but whether you'd actually have personal yeah. liability is also an open question. If yeah. you... If you proactively say, we're not getting, now, if you can't get coverage, if coverage just isn't being offered to you, that's one thing. But if coverage is being offered to you at a price that you just believe is obscenely high, but that's there, well, then, and, and you you proactively say, we're not doing it, well, then you could find yourself in uh, a little bit of hot water on a personal level. I don't say this to scare, and I'm not saying it definitively. I'm just saying that the facts 
remain, the possibility remains, and quite frankly, volunteer board members, it's not worth it, okay? What is important is that you, with your management team, are communicating to your membership. Don't just drop a budget on them with a line item that's gone up $300,000. Communicate with them, and every owner in the community, quite frankly, in Florida should be aware of this, but mm -hmm. communicate with them as quick, as much in advance as possible. Have your, and Andrew, I, I think you'll agree with this, have your insurance agent come out. And speak with yeah. them. Tell your tell your membership we're having an agent is coming out here as a courtesy to talk with all of us and answer questions and let us know what's up. So be proactive in that regard and then obtain the coverage. I just can't I can't emphasize enough. Obtain the coverage. No, yeah. Right. Well, and Michael, if I can add one thing to that, the and again, I I I uh, I agree. This is not to scare anyone, but it's it's the reality. You know, I, as as board members, you have to understand the full picture before you make a decision like that, right? And the, the director's and officer's policy, which is the important one, right, for the board, not all of them include coverage for failure to maintain adequate insurance. Right. Some, some of those policies have exclusions for failure to maintain insurance. I got to figure most of them would. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you that you can you can really put yourself in a challenging position without factoring all this in. And, and I agree, you know, have your agent come out. <laughs> it's, it's something, I don't know, I've done dozens of these in, in the past 12 months, whether it's a budget meeting or whether it's a, you know, come in and dodge some tomatoes for us type meeting. It's, <laughs> you know, it, it, uh, yeah. but it's helpful. You know, we yeah. found that us coming in and giving, some context, right? More than just saying your insurance is going up 50%, but coming in and saying, here's why can be very helpful in taking a lot of that tension off the board. Right. And right. it's just, right. Right. and people are going to be pissed off anyway, but it is what it is. And I just quickly want to say two things because it was a question up there. Someone asked to uh, clarify the effective date of the Senate Bill 2A. December 16th of 2022 is when the governor signed it. It took effect. Um, and one said, what is considered adequate coverage in terms of deductible, 5%, 3%. You're going to discuss that with your business advisor and your carrier. I believe a 3%, if the 3% is even, I don't even know if that's available on, on, on deductibles. Yeah. But um, that would be a business decision as far as, because your premium is going to be higher or lower depending on that deductible. So I think there, I don't think, I think the adequate property insurance coverage is that you are obtaining coverage based on a, a properly obtained uh, appraisal. Um, and then, of course, if you have this 5% deductible, know, know what that is going to equate to and, and be sure if, if you have the funds. If not, you do have the ability to special assess for that. Correct. And, and again, just to add to that communication conversation, and as you mentioned, Andrew, I mean, I know uh, your firm's very professional in, in your dealings. It, it is important to communicate to the residents whether you decide to change the deductible amount, whether you're having a challenge. I know this year, more than any other year, we've had more town halls. Um, during the town, during the budget process, just because it wasn't just insurance, you know, we had increased across the board with many things, staff salaries, um, cost uh, for, for FPL, water, everything has gone up exponentially for most of our associations. So, you know, we've done it either to make the lives of our memberships and our board members and our partners, vendors, um, easier is doing it through Zoom. That way you can control, you can pretty much provide the information that's necessary. It can be recorded. It can be um, passed along to those residents that weren't able to attend, and it makes it much more efficient. But we're, we're not, we're not, it, we're nowhere near the end of this um, next budget season, and the next two are going to be very difficult. Uh, now we're not the only industry with uh, our feet to the fire. <laughs> you right. guys have joined the party with us, Andrew. <laughs> yes, so, and you got, um, and you have Alex, who's uh, you know, Alex. I I, I hear what you're saying. Um, about owners, what if owners, you know, what if the association can't afford the the increase in insurance and and or another special assessment, and 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 I, you know, and I believe that is, you know, Alex's that's Alex's community. I believe that's not just Alex alone. Uh, and um, I had a, a a meeting with um, eight representatives of eighty communities in Margate, and what I said to them is, you guys need to put in writing 
how this is personally impacting you and send it to your representative, send it to your state representative, your state senator, send a copy to the governor, let them know what the, how these impacts are hitting you. I can, I'm going in Tallahassee next week. I'll be there, you know, next, next week, Monday through Wednesday to meet with legislators, talk about legislation. A lot of it having to do with the milestone inspection, the, res the, the structural integrity reserve study, other things that are impacting these three story and higher condos. Uh, uh, and, and also talk about some other legislation. And, and, and I'm sure this might come up, but they'll hear from me. And I do represent thousands of community, you know, of, of community representative owners and, and, and a lot of communities, but they want to hear from you all personally. So you need to make sure you're letting them know this and, and hopefully it doesn't fall on deaf ears. Um, and, and by the way, and, and, uh, and Andrew, you could also pre briefly, I know there's a few questions we want Andrew to hit before we leave, but um, the idea of um, the ability to finance the insurance premium. And I, and I know, Alex, it doesn't necessarily uh, help because ultimately financing doesn't need to be paid back, but at least it could spread the, the premium out over a year as opposed to having to pay it quickly. And maybe that would at least allow owners 12 months or 10 months to pay back the insurance increase. Uh, I believe that is an option for many communities. Yeah, it is. Financing? Yeah, I would I would say probably 75 to 80 percent of our communities currently finance their premiums, but it it uh, it certainly is. They're they're pretty flexible. You know, they, they'll do 12 equal most of the time. So that's absolutely an option. Okay, great. So I wanted to ask you, Andrew, here before I get to some of the questions of our listeners um, with regards to citizens. So, you know, many people have a concern. Is citizens good? Um, what are your thoughts on on coverage is being provided by citizens? Um, I do know that there was some, um, I believe that if there's a, a similar quote that's 20% uh, or uh, within 20% that they can't go on to citizens, if, if I recall that correctly, if you could give us uh, some information on that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, citizens is is the market of last resort in Florida. It's it's the state program. Um, you You have to be eligible. For citizens, you actually have to demonstrate one of two things makes you eligible. A, if there were no other options, right? So if citizens is literally the only quote that you received. Okay. Or B, it's kind of the, the loophole to that. If you did receive another option, but the premium for comparable coverage is 20% or more, then you're allowed to take the citizens option. Now, <laughs> citizens. There's there's a lot to unpack, but what I think is is probably the most important thing to communicate is historically citizens kind of the, the public perception is that it's more expensive, right, which has historically been the case. It's designed that way. It's designed not to compete with the private market, but what's happening is that citizens rates are capped. It's, it's the state program. Their rates are capped. Right. So the private marketplace, their rates are not capped because these are private companies. They go up and they go down. So with these increases that we're seeing, citizens rates have remained capped. But the private marketplace is is getting to the to the point now where generally they're as expensive or more than citizens. So a lot of our associations now are in a position where we're sitting down, and, and this is something that everyone needs to look at every year, right? Everything that's available, your community needs to see, you, right? So what we're doing is, is we're sitting down and we're looking at these options. We're looking at, you know, our, our renewal offer. We're looking at a citizen's option. We're looking at anything else that's out there, but that puts the board in a position to look at the bottom line and while there's some pretty significant coverage differences with citizens, a lot of our associations, it's it's getting to the point where the, the premium just makes sense. You know, so so it is the market of last resort, but it's it's frankly, it's designed for a market like this. Okay. So yeah, it's it's definitely something that needs to be considered. So so with that said, I know many times, especially from the management side, you know, we hear my managers or team members are saying, well, <clears throat> the board's asking me to shop, you know, the insurance around. I know that there's some complexity into it. So what are your thoughts um, now that we're going through this difficult market? What should board members be doing and what's the best way they should be going about this? Yeah, yeah, it is an incredibly unique 
uh, industry insurance. It's different than any other vendor in that when you're when you're shopping your insurance, right? It it really is designed for you to interview and select an agent because each of these insurance carriers, citizens included, right? They all offer the exact same pricing to every agent. Mm-hmm. In addition to that, if you do a meaningful amount of, of association business, you are likely all going to have access to the same carriers. We have access to the same carriers that, that your agent has access to. So it's, it's kind of very purposefully structured in a way where the board ideally should be selecting one agent that they trust and that they feel is going to best represent them in the marketplace, as in constantly bringing everything that's available in the market to to the renewal meeting, talking through options, budget meetings, servicing, that really should be what drives your decision. So again, I know that's that's much different than any other vendor, but I'm glad that that question came in because there's also a lot of misconception about that. Yeah, and we get that question. We try to explain it our best because the board members, unfortunately, don't understand that. Uh, we understand it clearly. You know, many of the agents, at least that we work with, are going to the same markets. So ultimately, what we want to work with is a person that understands the market, can provide that education, is willing to really go above and beyond and have those meetings with the board, explaining to them what's going on. And, you know, if their agent is not doing that, then that's when they need to start having a different conversation with another agent. And as you said it very eloquently, someone that you trust and could be a trusted advisor uh, for your uh, association. So I have a question here right back at you, Andrew, uh, from Plantation Terrace that asks, are admitted carriers writing association property coverage? Oh, man, <laughs> it's getting very thin. There there still are a few. American Coastal is, is doing a lot of it, but American Coastal is is also going through some changes. They're closed for new business right now. They're not writing anything new and they are reevaluating their current book of business. They're starting to non-renew certain accounts. Um, so they're admitted. Heritage is, is a, an admitted carrier and they are quoting some stuff right now, but I, I would say it's getting very, very limited. And what's, what's interesting and I, to, Honestly, I didn't re- I didn't know this until probably four or five years ago. Citizens, right? The state pool, the the state insurance carrier, not admitted. Wow. So wow. the state the state program is not admitted by the state. So it's it's just yeah they they are, but it's very limited. Wow, interesting. So I have a question for you here, Michael, and I know you're probably going to say you have to read the documents, but Daniel Smith <laughs> asked, uh, what can an HOA do to slow down the rate of insurance premium rising, forcing, let's say, eight, um, owners to install hurricane windows, putting on new roofs or any other suggestions? Yeah. And again, I, and quite frankly, I, I, I'll, I'll kick this to Andrew to, to piggyback <laughs> off of. Um, because really, that's a question for, for you, you. You pose that to your carrier. Hey, carrier, if we fully, if we have, if every unit in this condo has got impact glass, how will that impact our premium? What type of mitigation will we get on our premium? That's really going to come from them. What you're coming to me for then is how do we go about doing that? Carrier says, yeah, we're going to knock you down 10% if everybody's God, if you're every place, common element, as well as all the units, windows are all impact glass, we're going to save you, you know, making a percentage up, some X percentage. Well, then where I come in, Raphael, is how the board would properly go about uh, addressing that to the membership. And you're correct. It would require, um, in order to force owners to put in impact windows, you'd have to have an, I can't imagine it's going to be in the documents as drafted. It would be an amendment to the, the governing documents, the memory thing, the, how that's passed would be depending on what you need to do uh, to pass. I have a lot of communities and I have communities going back 20 years, uh, you know, or, or almost 20 years, like, you know, after after Wilma that that uh, did that, where they pass uh, amendments to their declaration of con, uh, uh, condominium, where they uh, required everyone to have impact glass installed by a date certain. Uh, and And that obviously over the years has helped very much. And from your side, Andrew, have you seen print? Have you seen, let's say, associations that have newer roofs? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Get better pricing than, let's say, and so I know every association is different because different structures, different 
Uh, but have you seen them getting better prices or you're still seeing increases? Yeah, well, so it, it is, it's, it's kind of an interesting time to have that conversation. And, and by the way, I'm working through this right now with numerous communities, right? And, and we've been involved from the start, which is how if your community is going about replacing roofs or something like that, you should be involving your agent, right? Because we can help quantify what that means and, and all of that. But it's, it's an interesting time because you kind of have to, it, it, it's a hard way to look at it because when we talk about a premium decrease, what we actually mean in this market is, you know, maybe our insurance goes up 35% instead of 50%, right? So it, it is still a, a net premium decrease, but it's, it's an increase that year, right? So, so that's, that's kind of the way that you have to look at it. It, it is meaningful, you know, new roofs and, and impact glass are the most meaningful things that, that you can do for your association from an insurance premium perspective. Correct. And one thing that hasn't been discussed that that's an important factor to, to keep top of mind is, you know, as these replacement cost um, appraisals come in, many times, you know, then we're not factoring in the increase in value of that property because of inflation, the cost of doing things, code, the changes in code. Um, so many times we just believe, oh, insurances went up 50 percent. Well, you kind of have to look at also what's the replacement cost increase that you had yeah. from three years ago to now. It's not a direct correlation, but there is a difference. There's going to be most of the time you're going to see an increase in that value uh, just because of general cost to replace these items and, and especially with what we've seen with inflation. Um, so yeah. I have one last question here. I'll ask you, Andrew, is from Roland. He asked, does an agent of record rules change with this bill? No, no. And I, I, I'm always glad when that gets brought up in, in these types of conversations because I just, frankly, I, I think there's a lack of transparency generally in our industry with, with regards to what that does. The, the agent of record letter that, that uh, we're referring to is a letter that you would sign as an association with the intent of hiring a new agent, right? It's, that is black and white. The reason I emphasize that is because there are a lot of agents that will kind of run around and say, sign this letter and I'll, I can go get you quotes, but you, you have to know that that letter, when you sign that letter, you are hiring a new agent and you are firing your current agent. Yeah. So yeah, that that's very important. And I'm, I'm glad that got brought up because I can't tell you how many board members I've talked to that have had bad experiences with that. Correct. Correct. Well, excellent. Well, um, I, I know I had the question a couple of times um, <clears throat> with this information is going to be shared and we will be sharing uh, this information uh, both on our YouTube page. We'll share it, we'll share it with you as well, so you can distribute it. Um, so if you want to share this link, uh, feel free to do so. I provided uh, both Michael, Andrew, and myself's contact information. Um, so if you have any questions with regards to what we discussed here today or any questions as to the legal or insurance or community association management, don't hesitate to reach out to one of us. I want to give you each an opportunity to provide some closing uh, remarks. So I'll start with you, Andrew, since I started with Michael last time. <laughs> well, I had fun. You know, I, I think that's uh, that's important. These are, you know, I, I know I said it earlier, but this is a, a very, very challenging time. We're having incredibly difficult conversations with our clients. So, you know, I, I appreciate you putting this together, Raphael. It's, it's something that's necessary. And I, you know, bringing as much transparency to the industry as possible is uh, is awesome. You know, generally, so so this was good. I I appreciate uh, everyone's time, and I I appreciate being uh, being able to have this conversation with the two of you. Great, thank you so much for being here, Andrew, and thank you for providing all the knowledge. Luckily, you're not a person that takes things personal, so you understand where <laughs> Mike and I were coming from. <laughs> so, I, Mike, I'll yeah. hand that off over to you. Any closing remarks? Uh, I mean, again, basically mirror a lot of what Andrew said. Uh, again, thank you to Raphael and the Affinity team for putting this together. Uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, and uh, we got to as many questions as we could. So hopefully, I apologize for those few questions we weren't able to answer. Uh, Less, if you're still online, uh, Andrew can confirm this, but Chapter 17 does not require that you use an admitted carrier. There are non-admitted carriers. As we just said, Citizens is a non-admitted carrier. So 17 does not require, you can use a non-admitted carrier without legal liability. 
so I got that one question answered because that was bugging me. Um, but anyway, I want to thank you all again uh, for this. I uh, hope we got, again, we did our best with what we have. Uh, <laughs> appreciate um, the, uh, uh, Raphael, you always bring great knowledge. Andrew, it's been a pleasure. I look forward to doing more of these with you and uh, picking your brain on future uh, insurance related questions. Uh, and uh, yeah, and thank you again and everybody stay well. Thank you, Michael. And on behalf of Affinity, we want to thank you all for being here today. Um, we had close to about 125 participants. So it goes to show the impact that this is having to our industry and to our associations in general. As I, the way I like to close my webinar is really thanking our board members, thanking our, our managers uh, for taking the time out of your day to, to gain some additional knowledge, to do a better job in educating uh, the residents that we serve, as well as the members that board members serve. Andrew and Michael, as always, it's always a pleasure being on with you. I'm looking forward to doing another webinar. And to my team behind the scenes, thank you for putting this together. We'll see you all in our next webinar. Have a great one, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks.